Did the CBC actually ask a good question? Accidentally, I think. Oh my goodness. Jagmeet Singh held a press conference in Halifax today where he wanted to talk about renters, but the topic that dominated the questions was a CN slash CP rail lockout. And because Jagmeet follows an ideology and not common sense, he was boxed into a corner. Let's take a look. Next, we have Brian Tomalty from the National Post. Yeah, uh, good morning, Mr. Singh. Um, I, I heard your comments on the rail strike off the top, but I just wanted to ask, I mean, Given the economic impacts of a strike like this, is there any sort of federal intervention that you would find acceptable? First of all, this this is uh, these are very important workers. Uh, their work is very important as well. Uh, I would say the only appropriate federal intervention is to force the employer to get back to the table and negotiate fairly with the workers. That's not something we see from the federal government. They often tip the scales against workers in favor of the employers, and that is absolutely wrong. The federal government should be there to defend workers, should not be tipping the scales for big bosses again and again, to the point that they know that they're just gonna come in and tip the scales and they're not gonna be, workers aren't gonna be able to get a fair deal. That is wrong. We're only in this position because the company, the both companies have failed to negotiate fairly with workers, in fact, have not shown good faith. If they negotiated in good faith, we would have a fair deal that gives good wages, and safety for the workers, which means safety for citizens. We know that rail safety is a very serious question. We've seen the impacts when we don't consider rail safety. If we don't take that seriously, the impacts are very devastating. So this is important for the workers. This is important for Canada to get this right. Fair wages and safety for the workers. Okay. So for those of you who may not be aware of what's going on, um, the workers under the union for... Uh, CN Rail and uh, CPKC or Canadian Pacific Kansas City Rail, um, they are negotiating with their respective companies on a new collective bargaining agreement. And a collective bargaining agreement is essentially the contract that the union negotiates with the, the employer. Uh, for those of you who already know this, forgive me. But the issue seems to be, um, according to what we've seen, is that the employer is frustrated uh, at how far apart that the unions are stating their negotiating position, and they've said, "Well, fine, you know, we're 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 too far apart." Now, that's what the em employer is saying. Um, so, what they've essentially sent out is a notice to lock out for, for CN Rail. And correspondingly, the unions have issued a notice to strike because they've told their employees, well, if you can't work, then you better be striking. So, but the problem is, is Jagmeet's assertion of, well, in all cases, it's never the union that is going to be the problem. It's always going to be the employer. You've worked places with problem unions and, it, and it's not the people in the union, it's the union leadership that Correct. creates the problems. I mean, look what's happening in Ontario with Fred Hahn. Correct. So, um, in, in, like, it's, it's not true in all cases. Yeah, in, in, in most cases that I've seen, um, all of, or most of the union workers are actually, you know, fine, upstanding people that just want to go to work and do their job. And they're annoyed that they're paying union dues, but there you are. So you have the executive, and in some cases, the representatives of the union aren't actually the workers inside the union. They are just the representatives. So they get paid to sit there and do nothing. Yeah, they get paid to represent the workers. Right. So they actually get paid to be like the national president or whatever it is, right? Um, so that's one of the one of the issues there um, i've been in companies where we were negotiating with the unions and the union was being absolutely ridiculous in, in terms of their posture and they didn't even share it with their members so the members don't even know what they're negotiating in terms of their posture um so you know we wanted to take them to arbitration because they were being ridiculous now again bad union leadership 
and there's risk to going to arbitration because you, if you go to arbitration, then you have a third party arbitrator that looks at what the union's offering, looks at what the employer's offering, and whatever they decide is final. You don't get to you know negotiate that. So it could go for you or it could go against you. So it's always risky going to an arbitrator. Well, and you know what they say, a good deal is where nobody's happy. Yeah, that's actually, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, if, if you exit a negotiation with both sides unhappy, then it's probably fair. So, um, but to just assume that it's always the big boss man that, that, that's bad, uh, that's a pretty ridiculous posture. Now, is it possible? Yeah, it is. But the thing that I don't understand, and I'm not going to really comment definitively on this, is I don't understand the issue of safety because there are labor protection laws in Canada. There's something called the Canada Labor Code, which actually makes a lot of unions irrelevant at this point. Yeah, but I mean, rail is incredibly dangerous. Um, All the more reason for the Canada Labor Code and, and the safety law. Yeah, but I mean, when was the Labor Code written? How many years ago? Do we even know? Like, it's probably out of date. It's probably not specific to any one, uh, any one industry. I know, um, I think it was last year, there was a death here in Hamilton at one of the, uh, I, think it was, I think it was a rail car plant, actually. And... Um, and it was a location where they produced rail cars and someone died. And it wasn't the first time someone died at that facility. Well, and this is the thing, right? So if there are, are actual needs for additional safety clauses within the contract, then of course they need to be there. And there's been some assertions from the union that there are um, pieces in the contract that the rail companies are trying to take out in terms of safety. So it depends, are they valid, are they not? So there are certain, there are certainly cases where the employer acts in bad faith and is asking for ridiculous things to be taken out of the agreement. And there's also cases where the union acts in bad faith and they're asking for ridiculous things to be put into the agreement. Or taken out, right? Well, either way, rule number one in a union is you never take anything out of the agreement. You only put in. That's that's usually the rule of unions, because if it's in there, then you've wanted it in there. So my question is, are they arguing for pay for salary? That's part of it. But, but is that like a bone of contention within this whole thing? There, there's there's a few things. There's always a few things. But, safety... but is salary one of them? Because my 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 train of logic, if you'll forgive the pun, is that, uh, you know, the, the employer will offer X for a wage increase and the union will say, no, we want Y and Y may be like way above and beyond what the employer is even capable of paying. And if they're fighting so hard for pay specifically, again, we don't know for sure. This is just speculation. But if they are fighting so hard for pay specifically, my guess is that it's due to inflation because nobody can afford anything because of inflation and because of all these taxes. My guess is, well, every negotiation I've ever been a part of that um, there's always been contentiousness in there. Wage is always in there. It's always a, a bone of contention because the union wants to get the maximum amount possible for its members and the employer wants to give the minimum amount possible. That's just how it goes. Um, so the question is, is how far or, or below, um, you know, safety is the priority of wage in here? Well, but my point is that it seems like these public sector unions and, and like these crown corp unions lately have been arguing for more pay, especially that's been like a major focus because inflation is so bad. And who caused that inflation? Well, it was the liberals with the support of the NDP. Well, and here's the other thing. Um, at every other company uh, that isn't unionized, you know what they got for an inflation raise? Nothing. So those companies don't really have a lot of, you know, sympathy for uh, for unions. Now the union people will just say, well, that's all the more re reason to unionize. Yeah, there's good and bad to, to unions, but anyway. Um, so this uh, it's, it's an interesting discussion that can go on for about two hours, but we're not gonna do that. The only other thing that I'll leave you with is if the, uh, if the workers were to be locked out, that has the potential of costing Canada up to $1 billion per day. 
the United States is very concerned about this. This could have an impact on our ports um, and it could have an impact on businesses across the country that rely on shippable goods. It could increase prices at the grocery stores. Wink, wink, Mr. Singh. And the liberals have already committed that they're not going to intervene here. So their precious economy could grind to a halt as a result of not intervening in a potential work stoppage. So that's where we are in the uh, on the CN rail strike. But let's continue. In the event that the government decides to bring in either back to work legislation or binding arbitration, uh, would that impact um, the supply and confidence agreement? We made it very clear that we would oppose both of those. We oppose those vehemently. The government should not be tipping the scales in favor of the big bosses again by signaling any sort of intervention that favors the big bosses in this case, the employers in this case. That's wrong. We would oppose that every step of the way. Yeah, so screw all the Canadians who are going to have to pay more for groceries, who are going to be greeted by empty shelves. Like, this guy, his ideology just overrides all logic. Well, and the other thing is that he didn't answer the question of whether this would impact the supply and confidence agreement because he knows he won't. <laughs> Nothing's going to impact that supply and confidence agreement at this point. He's going to be, you know, in the supply and confidence agreement right up until the very end. And then this time next year, expect us all to believe that we should vote NDP because they've been the ones here supporting Canadians this yeah, whole they've time. they've been fighting the whole time. <laughs> We've been fighting hard for Canadians for this free dental care program that's not even free. Well, and here's the thing. Um, so as far as CN goes, CN is actually locking out their workers. So for Jagmeet to say, well, the government's putting their, you know, their finger on the scale of justice and, and, and they're taking these rights away from the workers. Well, wouldn't the government intervening actually force <laughs> the CN to actually allow their workers back on the job? Because the CN workers aren't the ones walking off at this point. So that's actually forcing CN to bring the workers back to work. Yeah, and another thing, with the help of the NDP, they've recently passed anti-scab legislation. So, I mean, the economy could go to hell in a handbasket over this. And there's nothing that anybody can do because of this legislation and because of the government's reluctance to get involved. Right. So... Ladies and gentlemen, this is what happens when you commit to an ideology and not common sense. But we're not done yet. Next, we have Evan Geyer from the CBC. Hi there. Um, I heard your uh, comments, opening comments about the potential rail strike, but I'm just wondering, you, you've been talking about affordability and you, you know, one of the issues there is the price of groceries and so on. And any kind of a major interruption of rail delivery would cause those things to spike. Do you not have concerns about the effect that a strike by fairly well-paid workers at places like CN and CP would have on low-income Canadians who have to buy groceries? I would not be pitting workers against each other. This is about a big boss that's making massive profits, that's not treating the workers fairly, and are not negotiating in good faith. If they negotiated in good faith, if CP Rail and CN Rail negotiate in good faith, there would be a settlement. And the settlement's about making sure workers get paid a decent wage that keeps up with the cost of living, something I frankly think every worker should get, as well as keeping the workers safe. Because keeping workers safe directly impacts overall safety of the rail system. And that is something that we've seen under the Conservatives. When we erode rail safety, there are serious disasters. And that cannot happen again. So this is really about... Uh, the CN Rail and CP Rail, big profitable corporations trying to exploit workers, and we should stop that from happening. There should be a fair settlement negotiated, and the federal government should not be intervening to tip the scales towards these big companies again. That is wrong, and we will oppose that. Did the CBC actually ask a good question? Accidentally, I think. Oh, my goodness. I, I, don't, I don't think they meant to ask the question, <laughs> personally. <laughs> but, you know, they did make a good point. So... You're, you're saying that these, you know, these poor CP workers essentially is, is kind of the way the question was phrased, who are making good wages, um, their strike is going to affect people at the grocery store, people who cannot afford food as it is, people who are low income, people who may be on disability, people who may need help. And 
like why would you not want to try to get an arbitrator why would you not want to try to resolve this as quickly as possible for all those canadians who cannot afford a further spike at the grocery store right if i was prime minister and I, I was looking at a situation like this the way that you remove yourself but still ensure that there's no work stoppage is say all right employer union you guys have until friday to reach a deal otherwise I am implementing legislation that is going to have binding arbitration come into play. Meaning the government is forcing both sides to adhere to an arbitrator. So it's in the best interest of those two parties to come to a deal before they go to the arbitration because they don't know what's going to happen. But it would set a time limit and it would allow any of the businesses out there to try to at least buffer the damage to mitigate it because they know that after that day, new contracts coming in one way or the other, and then everybody's back to work. So that's what I would do. And that's not putting you know hands on any scales of justice. That's saying, I'm appointing somebody in uh, independent to get this thing done. So you guys better find a deal before then. Otherwise you risk a bad deal. That's what I would be doing. And uh, actually just one, one second piece. Our big concern around the cost of groceries is that big corporations are ripping off Canadians again in that area. We saw the bread price fixing where they made billions of dollars, it turns out, ripping off Canadians. And the biggest fine that they were awarded or the biggest fine against them uh, for one of the ma major players was only $50 million for Canada Bread Company. So how is that going to deter them from doing it again? That's what I mean when I talk about the rules that are rigged against people and in favor of these large corporations when they have very little jeopardy they're facing and they can make massive profits ripping off people and breaking the law, what's to stop them from doing it again? They already did it. That's what I'm saying. We gotta change the rules to protect people from being exploited and gouged by these corporations that have already done so. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about affordability. Hey, that's not true. Loblaws had to pay half a billion dollars with a B in regards to that bread price fixing scam. Yeah, so he's trying to say that, oh, well, you know, there's no significant fines. I'm pretty sure Loblaws would regard $500 million as a significant fine. That's huge. Um, but anyway, he's always coming back to greedy CEOs, greedy CEOs. <laughs> Dude. Because that's all he has. Like, the NDP is supposed to be the union of workers, and Pierre's just come in and eat their lunch, right? Um, and so he has to blindly support these union workers, even though it could be disastrous for the economy of the entire country. It could mean higher prices at the grocery store for all of us, but he's somehow managing to, to blame this on greedy CEOs at the grocery store. Well, and this is the guy that says, I'm going to be the next prime minister of Canada. Really? So the next prime minister of Canada is just going to say, screw you to the entire Canadian economy. Screw you to all of the businesses out there that are going to be crushed or at least in significant peril should there be an extended work stoppage of the Canadian rail system. The, the, the next prime minister of Canada is going to be having a diplomatic issue with the United States because this is going to be impacting their economy. But all you give a crap about is well you know union unions unions union unions that's it well and again supporting something blindly with no no common sense i mean there always has to be middle ground there always has to be middle ground and room for negotiation when you leave those things out you're following an ideology and that's where you get into trouble and this is the dangers when you have somebody like the ndp on the left or somebody on the extreme right in a position where they can influence what happens in Canada. This is the problem. So again, Jagmeet, all of your supporters or ex-supporters are looking at you right now. And all they're seeing is somebody who supports costing the Canadian economy $1 billion a day when 25% of Canadians are already in poverty and 25% of Canadians are expected to use a food bank this fall. And I heard you say you don't want the federal government to put its finger on the scales on the side of the employer, but why would sending this dispute to binding arbitration, for example, be taking the side of the employer? Wouldn't that simply be putting it into a venue where it can be decided independently and fairly? 
Well, it takes away the right to negotiate. And fundamentally, the right to negotiate is is, is about fairness, in fact, for, for both parties. And workers, uh, in all cases, would rather negotiate fairly at the table rather than be forced to go into bounding arbitration, which could go either way. Depending on the arbitrariness of the arbitrator, it could be something that hurts the workers. It could favor the employer. We don't know. Uh, what is more fair is to negotiate at the table. And binding arbitration is something that the employers want to see happen. Um, for some reason, it must benefit them. And so what we want in all cases is workers to be able to negotiate their, their settlements, their agreements in a fair way. That is the fundamental principle of a collective agreement. That is what New Democrats believe in. It is clear from example of again and again that neither the liberals and Justin Trudeau nor Pierre Polyev and the conservatives care in the same way about having fair negotiated settlements and agreements. That's the difference between us and them. He said something very revealing there. He said what you said earlier. What he, but he, what he also said is the employer seems to want to go to binding arbitration. Yeah, because they want workers back doing the job. They want trains going across Canada bringing products to Canadians. That's, that's, that's one important reason. But in my experience, the only reason why an employer would want to go to arbitration is because the union is so out to lunch that the arbitrator will look at their proposal and say, what is wrong with you? Well, and that's exactly it. An arbitrator comes in and they don't really know too much about either party. They just like come in. They don't have an emotional attachment to anybody. They look at the facts and they go, all right, this, 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 and this. Have a good day. Like they don't, it's no skin off their teeth, right? Yeah, it happens relatively quickly because there, again, there's no negotiating with an arbitrator. Right, the arbitrator just comes in and goes, well, this, 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 this. Okay, here you go, guys. See ya. So again, if the employer wants to go to arbitration, then it's possible. I'm not saying this is the truth. I'm just reading the tea leaves here, but it's possible that the employer has become so frustrated with the outrageous negotiating position from the unions, assuming it is outrageous, that they're like, fine, locked out. And uh, yeah, let's go to arbitration. Would love to, because but they're going to see that you guys are so far out to left field that there's very little possibility that we get a bad deal. But even the employer knows that going to arbitration, they could lose if you want to use that term um but but they could have to provide things that they were not prepared to provide right Correct. maybe they could have to provide higher wages if the arbitrator says nope this is what's fair this is what you're doing so it's a risk for them too i think in many cases as ryan said it's a case of one party being way off the mark and trying to bring things back to center um and in some cases it's you know, this could really kill our economy. Let's get back to work type thing. Well, and and again, the reporter nailed it when they said, why wouldn't you be in favor of putting this in front of an arbitrator? Oh, well, it well, it takes the way the, 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 the you know, the, the opportunity to negotiate. That's been there and the sides haven't been able to come to a deal. So in the interest of the Canadian economy, guess what? Um, this is a bigger picture than you guys. You had your shot. Off you go. And this is why I would say you give them a deadline. You guys better have a deal or at least commit to the fact that, you know what, we're going to continue to negotiate or you're going to you're going to go to binding arbitration. And that's the end of it. So, again, Singh is so committed to his ideology. He cannot see anything above that. Next, we have Mickey Durjic from the Canadian Press. Uh, thanks. On the same topic, so I guess, would the NDP ever support back-to-work legislation for this potential work stoppage? No. Right there, ladies and gentlemen, the NDP doesn't care how this destroys our economy. The NDP doesn't care how much you have to pay at the grocery store as a result of this work stoppage. They do not support back-to-work legislation. No matter what it costs. No matter what it costs you.